Let's try that again. <laughs> So rest in 
look upon the waters wherever you would call me take me deeper than my feet could ever wander and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my savior spirit lead me where my trust is without borders let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me take me deeper than my feet could ever wander and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my savior spirit lead me where my trust is without borders let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me take me deeper than my feet could ever wander and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my savior the spirit lead me where my trust is without borders let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me take me deeper than my feet could ever wander and my faith will be made stronger presence of my
Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity that we can gather this morning. We thank you for the ability to worship you in the midst of all that's going on. Father, we just lift your name on high, and we recognize that there is no other name that is greater than your name. So, Jesus, we just proclaim your name loudly. Heavenly Father, I thank you for all that you're doing in the midst of all of this. Thank you for the testimonies that you're writing in our lives. Thank you for the stories that you are telling all around us. Thank you for the moments that you are giving to interact with others and to share goodness in the midst of something that seems like darkness. God, we love you and we praise you in your name. Amen. Guys, there's a couple ways that you can give here at Renaissance Road Church. You can give uh, at our offering kiosk, which is in the back of our auditorium, or you can go online to r2live.tv, click the giving tab, or you can go to the hub. You can give safely and securely this way. I'm holding in my arm a big box of food. This is called an emergency food box. And recently, Renaissance Road Church received 500 of these boxes. And honestly, we didn't know what we were going to do with all of these boxes. But we partnered with six other ministries to distribute 500 boxes to people that are in need. And we could not have done that had it not been for your faithful giving for your faithful offering and tithes so that we can partner with other people. Isn't it amazing to know that not only do we host a food bank that feeds people every single week, but we partner with other ministries who are going beyond the doors of where we're able to go to, beyond the walls of what we're able to see, and we're able to meet a need in so many different places. So can we just give a round of applause for Pastor Paula and for Paul and Flo and Linda and everybody else who helps with our food bank so faithfully. Thank you guys so much for the hard work that you do, unloading truck every single week, moving boxes, and making sure that other people are well fed. We appreciate that, so thank you guys so much. I wanna let you guys know that our shoe drive is rounding out. Next week is our last week, and I wanna challenge you with something. We had a goal of reaching 3,000 pairs of shoes so that we could gather and then give back to people that are in need. And we're just a little shy of our goal. And so here's my challenge to you. Next Sunday, I want to invite every single person who is here or who will be attending next week to bring with them a pair of shoes. Bring with you one pair of shoes at least that you can bring to church and that you can donate to someone who is in need because every single day there are thousands of people who walk around without a decent pair of shoes and you guys are making a tremendous impact so far. So thank you guys so much for those of you in your small group or in your ministry team as you have collected shoes. We really appreciate that and we look forward to seeing how they will be used in the future. Everybody say Christmas, Christmas. is right around the corner. Christmas at R2 will be taking place on Tuesday, December the 22nd. There will be two services. There will be one service at 6 p.m. and one service at 8 p.m. Renaissance Kids will be open for both of those services, so we invite your whole family to come and join us for that day. It will be a special night. Candle lights and some incredible music and also an amazing message so that you can get to the heart of what this Advent season is all about. And you can find the hope and the peace and the joy that rests in Jesus Christ. And then one final thing, if you want to find out what's happening here at Renaissance Road Church, we tell you all the time, go to the hub, download the hub. That is our app. That's where you can find out past messages. You can see what's happening here and around this community. And also that's a safe way for you to give. All right. Thank you guys so much. We're about to go back into worship. But before we get there, let's bow our heads and let's pray. God, as we sing these next songs, God, we just give everything we've got back to you. God, we welcome your presence into this place. We feel it. We recognize that it is already here. But God, just let us uh, experience it to overflowing this morning. God, move in us and change us. Make us be different than we arrived. And all these things, we give you praise. Amen.
Be what you've always been, the fire, the refiner. If the altar's where you meet us, take me there, take me there. If it's what you need, it's just an offering. It's right here, my life is here, and I'll be a living sacrifice for you. You're the fire, the refiner. I want to be consumed. I want to be tried by fire. Purify. You take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. I want to be tried by fire. Purify. You take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. If your glory wants to come here, let it flow. We want it all. Your fire is consuming. Fill this place, set it ablaze, and I'll be a living sacrifice for you. You're the fire. The refiner, I want to be consumed, I want to be tried by fire, purified, you take whatever you desire, Lord, here's my life, I want to be tried. thinking sometimes we sing the craziest things I mean, think about the lyrics to that song that you were just singing I want to be tried by fire have you ever been burned have you ever been spiritually burned does anybody know what I'm talking about yeah. <laughs> and then I thought about one of the worst things I've ever been through as a parent uh, our middle child Selah 
who was running our cameras this morning, when she was two or three years old, she burned her forearm, she's two or three, on a stove in the kitchen. And when she did it, the shriek that went through our house was like blood curdling. As a daddy, hearing my, my two-year-old scream like that still sends chills through my spine, you know? And, and, and Sela runs to me and her mom, and she has this blister that has already risen on her and it's, it's taken up her entire forearm. Her entire forearm is a giant blister. And Sela is going crazy. Here's something about being on fire. When you're on fire, you don't care what you look like, right? Because when you're on fire, the only thing that matters is that you just got burned. And, and I thought about how that maybe you're here this morning and, you know, we're singing about the joy of the season and, and faith and walking, and walking on water, but, but and then, oh, that's nice, right? It's good. It sounds good. These guys do a good job, but let's just be real. You got that one thing going on in your life that's burning you right now. I'll bet you that there are a lot of people in this room right now and you're dealing with that one thing and it's all that matters. When Selah got burned, her arm was on like a pillow for the next week. It, it was all that mattered. And, and, and it was really, as a father, what, what I focused on. It was all that mattered, getting Selah better. So what I want you to hear this morning is this. The Father in heaven sees the area of your life of concern. The, the Father sees where you're being burned right now. And He wants to bring healing to it. We're going to go back into this chorus and we're going to sing sing it again but 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 this time when we sing it I want you to give that one thing to God forget about everything else and let's focus on that thing that thing that is pressuring you that thing that is bothering you I don't know what it is maybe it's something in your marriage maybe it's something in your finances maybe it's something at work I don't know I don't know but I want you to give it to God when, when, when Sila got burned she came to us like this and so look if you're comfortable if you're comfortable, I want you to lift your hands and give it to God. If you're not comfortable, that's cool. Just give it to God in your heart. Maybe at your, you can just turn your palms out like this. But I want you to, to give this thing that's burning you to God. So lift those hands if you're comfortable. But, but in any event, just give it to God. Let's sing this, man. Give it to Him. God, we give it to you right now. Whatever it is. So clean my hands. Purify my heart. We give it to you, heart. God. I want to burn for you, it's yours. only for you, take We don't want to worry about it anymore. As a sacrifice, take it from us, God. I want to burn for you, only for you. Lift the burden, oh God. my hands. Yes, yes. You find yes. my heart.
hear the Spirit of God in this room say to you, cast your burdens upon me and take my burden upon you. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Father, we thank you that you are a God, you are a daddy who sees where we're hurting and you show up every time. In the name of Jesus, amen. And amen. Can we give God a great big hand clap for already talking to us? Hey, you all can have a seat as the lights in the room come up. You can have a seat. Hey, good morning, family. Welcome to church. My name is Pastor Jason. I want to welcome you to Renaissance Road Church, soon to become Renaissance Church in the coming year. I'm excited about that. If you want to know a little more about us and who we are, we are a church where you can find family, where you can pursue your purpose, where you can share your story, and where you can experience life change. I uh, have a couple of very quick announcements for you before we jump into the Word. First of all, we are now three weeks into our yearly faith commitment season. Every year we spend a few Sundays and we ask those of you who call our church home to, uh, to commit to a level of finances that God is leading you to give, a, a level of generosity in the next year. And so we are now on our third Sunday of this, and three Sundays into this, um, we have a $30,000 a month minimum budget, and then our goal for this year is $35,000 a month, so that's where we're trying to get to. And so uh, three weeks into this, we are at an amount of $28,400. I want you to applaud all the folks who have, who have said, you know what, I'm going to help build the kingdom here at Renaissance Road Church. Around all of your seats are these little anonymous faith commitment cards. Um, if God is leading you to plant here and, um, and into generosity in 2021, I want to encourage you to fill one of these out and then slip it in the box at the back of the auditorium as you're coming in. You can put it there and we will count your generosity towards our budget for 2021. We've got a lot of amazing things God is wanting to do in this place in 2021 as we come out of this pandemic. I really do believe revival is coming. I really do believe it. Let me say that again so that maybe you can respond a little more appropriately. i, I got to wake you up this morning. I can tell already. I said, I really do believe that revival is coming. Yeah. All right, that's a little better. I'm like, did I step into the wrong church or something? What just happened? Hey, a couple of other quick announcements for you. We regularly do a thing we call lunch with the pastor. Um, it is an opportunity if you are newer to our church to sit and have lunch with me. We provide lunch and childcare. We do it right after this service today. And so if you want to know more about this church, if you want to find out about our history and where we're going, then Lunch with the Pastor is for you. We meet at the back of the auditorium at that big table that says next step. There'll be a sign that says Lunch with the Pastor. We will feed you and we will take care of your children for you. So a little more of a break for you if you need that kind of thing. I, I know uh, if, if you're like me and there's a lot of distance learning going on, another hour of freedom could be pretty awesome. And so um, join me for Lunch with the Pastor. Today we'll provide, again, lunch and child care. It's great. And, and, and then uh, finally, I've got one more thing for you. We've talked a lot about you, our church, going to a next level of influence. That this church will increase in influence and be who God has called us to be as you increase in influence. And uh, one of the things that God has laid on my heart, and I've been working with Pastor Sean on this, is a mentoring program. A, a mentoring program to, to take you to the next level. One of the things that has meant a world to me as I've grown in God are the men and women of God who have taken the time to have lunch with me, to sit down and say, hey, you're being dumb. You need to, you need to, adjust, you need to adjust your attitude. You need to think about this or that. And so we've got a group of people who want to be mentors. And I believe there are a lot of you out there who are feeling like, you know, there's more for me. I need to go to the next level. You want to be mentored. And so if that's you, on your way out today, Pastor Sean will be at that next steps table at the back of the room here. And you can say, hey, I'm interested in this mentoring program. Please, please tell me more about it. Uh, let me know more about mentoring. And so um, if you want to do that and go to the next level, I highly encourage it. Listen, I've got a mentor and I'm a pastor, but I, God's not through with me yet. I think God's just getting started with me, you know? And so we all need it. I want to encourage you 
to be mentored. All right. Are you all ready for the Word of God now? Yeah. All right, good. Now you're waking up a little bit. I like that. I like that. So we are in a message series that we call Advent. What is Advent? It's a traditional celebration. A Advent is a five-week celebration that looks back at how uh, the Jewish people were waiting on Jesus to come the first time. A Advent is really a celebration of waiting. And, and I thought that's kind of funny because nobody likes to celebrate waiting. Nobody likes to wait. I mean, just see you in rush hour traffic. You don't like waiting. Just see you in the line at the grocery store. Nobody likes waiting, but here we are celebrating waiting. I think it's kind of crazy. But I think that there are lessons that we can learn from waiting that maybe should excite us. And so Advent is a five-week celebration of how they waited for Jesus to come the first time. And from them, we can learn how to wait on Jesus to come the second time. I don't know about you, but I am ready for Jesus to show up in my life here at the end of 2020. Maybe that's just me. But I am ready for Jesus to show up and change everything. I'm ready for 2021. And so as we wait on Jesus to show up, and reveal himself at a deeper level, we learn how they waited on Jesus the first time. Advent is a five-week celebration. Each week has a theme. Each theme has a candle. We light a candle. And so up on the screens here, we've lit a candle for this week. Somebody last week said, why are there no like real candles? We had real candles in my church where I grew up. Well, 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 sorry, but we had a fire in this church about three months ago, and I'm a little bit squeamish around open flames right now, okay? And I've heard there's a candlelight Christmas coming up for us in a few weeks. I'm really praying and fasting about that. Right now, our candles are up on the screens, okay? And so each week has a candle, and the candle represents a theme. Last week, the theme was hope. Remember? And I told you, I said, contrary to popular belief, our hope is not in a better day. At the end of 2020, our hope is not in 2021. Our hope is not in a better day. Our hope is not in a better job. Our hope is not in a better marriage. Our hope is not even in a better vaccine. Our hope, I told you last week, is in a person. His name is is Jesus. Our hope is not in a better thing or better place. Our hope is in Jesus. Last week I talked to you about hope for the person, getting to the person. Last week the theme was hope. This week the theme is faith. Everybody say faith. faith. The theme this week is faith. And if last week I talked to you about hope for the person of Jesus, this week I want to talk to you about faith and getting to a place. If, if last week was about getting to a person, this week I want to talk to you about getting to a place. The title of my message today is called, is called Faith for the Place. Faith for the Place, because Jesus is always taking you to a new place, a different place. And, and to get us there, we're going to begin reading this morning in the book of Luke chapter 2. So find your way, if you've got your Bibles, to Luke chapter 2. And listen, if you don't have your Bibles, that's okay. We've got the notes on the screens for you. Also in the church app that we call the Hub, everything is there as well. Find your way to Luke chapter 2 and stand to your feet and we're going to read God's Word together. At our church, we stand for the initial reading of God's Word because we believe that God's Word is speaking to us. God's Word is just as real to us now as it was when Jesus was born 2,000 years ago. And so, if this is the faith week, as you all are finding your way to Luke chapter 2, it is traditionally a week where we celebrate the faith of Mary and Joseph as Mary and Joseph make this 100 miles long trip from their town of Bethlehem, from their town of Nazareth to their ancestral home of Bethlehem. It was a hundred miles trip that Mary is nine months pregnant for. And we call this a journey of faith. And that's traditionally what we celebrate in the faith week. And so I'm going to just read to you this part of the story from the book of Luke, chapter 2, verse 2. It says, And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. And some translations say taxed. That all the world should be registered. This census first took place 
while Quirinius was governing. There's a name somebody should bring back, Quirinius, right? That, that name's got some swag to it. While Quirinius was governing Syria. Verse 3 says, so all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Verse 4 says, Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. And let's just stop here for a minute. Look at this. Jesus hasn't even been born yet. And Jesus has already got people making a 100 miles long journey of faith for him. Not even born yet. Jesus is a fetus. And Jesus has still got people making a journey of faith for him. This is, this is Jesus for you, right? Listen, if it is true that our hope is in a person, Jesus, we also need to understand that it is equally true that the person of Jesus is always calling us to a new place. The person of Jesus is always saying things like, Behold, I am doing a new thing in your life. The person of Jesus is always saying things like, Come. Everybody say, Come. Come, and I will make you fishers of men. In other words, you can't stay where you are, fishermen. You gotta come. You gotta get up out of your boats and follow me. The person of Jesus is always calling you to a different place, to a higher place, to a better place. Always, before he's even born, he's got Mary and Joseph doing this crazy, crazy thing. Following Jesus means you got to get up off your seat and walk. Following Jesus means you cannot sit in the bleachers. I thought about, I thought about how when I was growing up in my high school, there was this one kid who would never dress out for P.E., Everybody know what I'm talking about? Like there was, there's always that one kid. Maybe you were that one kid. I don't know. But, but the kid, oh, and his name was Ned Smith, by the way. And, 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 and so Ned Smith was always sitting in the bleachers at PE time. He always had an excuse. Like, I turned my ankle today. My stomach is hurting. My, my parents were argu arguing last night. He always had an excuse. This is what I know. Following Jesus means you cannot be Ned Smith. You gotta drop the excuses. Get up off the bleachers and walk. And come, everybody say, come. 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 So I want you to help the crazy preacher preach this message. And I want you to look at one person in a socially distant and appropriate way and tell them, neighbor, say, neighbor, don't be Ned Smith. You gotta get up off the bleachers and walk. This next piece, as you're finding your way to your seat. As you're finding your way to your seat, I am so excited about what's about to happen in this room. Because every week of Advent, we have a different influencer taking two minutes and talking to you about the theme of the morning. Last week for the Hope Week, we had Carolina Panthers legend Steve Smith talk to Renaissance Road Church about hope. This week is my favorite one. I'm so excited to tell you that to talk to you about faith with a message specially recorded for you, Renaissance Road, is the one and only Steve Harvey. Watch this. Well, Merry Christmas, everybody. I know you know who this is. If you don't, you haven't paid your electric bill in 15 years, probably 30. I'm on everybody's TV. Listen, I just wanted to say uh, Merry Christmas and uh, all of you at the Renaissance Road and all of the triad of North Carolina wishing you a season of faith. I got a lot of faith, man. My mama taught it to me. I'm sure glad she did. Uh, the word faith is important to you all. It's pretty big to me. Faith is the belief in things that you cannot see. And I sure didn't see me coming. That's what faith is. Keep it, y'all. <laughs> Steve Harvey, everybody. 
that video is about to go live on the Renaissance Road Church Facebook page. I want to encourage you to share this message of faith with the triad. One of the values of our church is you sharing your story. We try to make it easy for you sometimes to share your story. What better way to share what God is doing in your church than to share Steve Harvey with the triad. This thing is going to go viral. So share the story of faith this season. I don't know how I follow up that. Well, gosh, we'll try. We'll try. Um, so the faith celebration in the Advent week is a week where we, we honor Mary and Joseph and their trip 100 miles long from Nazareth to Bethlehem. And I thought, but why do we celebrate this trip? Why is this trip so important? Why do we call this faith? I mean, I take trips all the time. And we don't call it faith. It's just I'm going to Harris Teeter to pick up some toilet paper or something, you know? We don't call that faith. And Mary and Joseph took other trips. Why do we call this particular trip a faith trip? And, and, and so I thought about that, and, and, and I made a list of reasons, obstacles that they were facing that we would call this faith. And when I'm done sharing my list with you, I think you'll see why this trip is faith on steroids. So I made a list, and first on my list, I wrote that they're taking this trip when Mary is nine months old. Pregnant, y'all. A hundred miles when Mary is nine months pregnant. First of all, have you ever done anything with a nine months pregnant woman? Any, like enough said, you know? Not, not enough said because I don't want to start a church split, you know? Enough said because my brother, I don't want to make your ride home even a little awkward as your wife or significant others talking about the insensitive preacher. So enough said, enough said. Except... Nine months pregnant women just pee a lot. You know, that's all I'm going to say. But enough said. They, Mary and Joseph, are making this trip a hundred miles long when she is nine months pregnant. They're doing it by foot. And if you believe like the pictures on TV by camel or by donkey, they're not doing it by like an air-conditioned Subaru like you might be doing it. They're making this trip over a hundred miles by foot when she is nine months pregnant. This is a most uncomfortable journey. If you're taking notes, you should write this down. Real faith, everybody say faith. Real faith is not about your comfort. It is about your obedience. Real faith is not about your comfort. It's about your obedience. And since it's not about your comfort, real faith therefore will often stretch you. Because real faith is not comfortable. And I have a question for you. I've got a few this morning for you actually. Are you comfortable? Are you comfortable? Are you comfortable with the current level of God that you are experiencing in your life? There, there was a, a point in time about 18 months ago where I told my wife, I said, I feel like my, I'm comfortable in my life. I feel like I finally got things under control. I learned you never say stuff like that out loud, you know. Are you comfortable with the current level of God that you are experiencing? Are you comfortable with your current level of generosity? Are you comfortable with the current level of forgiveness that you are willing to extend? Oh, that's a hard one. Are you current with the current amount of uh, of, of church attendance that you are making for yourself and your family. Are you comfortable? Are you comfortable with where you are? Because if you are, I want you to imagine a nine months pregnant Mary in the middle of a 100 mile journey, not through an air conditioned Subaru, stopping in the middle of her journey standing straight up, wiping the sweat off of her brow and staring at you if you're comfortable. Actually, she's not even staring at you. She's like giving you side eye, you know? And Mary is saying to you, really? You can't get up off the bleachers? But here I am, nine months pregnant, 
swollen ankles and stretch marks. If I can do it nine months pregnant with swollen ankles and stretch marks, you can get up off the bleacher, stop being Ned Smith, and you can stretch yourself too. I want you to hear Mary tell you, stretch. Are you comfortable? If you are, if you are, see Mary giving you that side eye and saying, stretch. See, this is how we go. This is what we do. We sit in the bleachers and we pray. And we're like, oh God, and maybe we even hold our hands up like this, you know, because it looks holy, you know. Oh God, bless me. God, use me. However you want to use me, just, just use me. God, bless me. Fill my cup up, God. And, and there's a verse in the Bible, by the way, <clears throat> that says faith without works is dead. You know that verse? I would like to extend that verse and say to you that prayer without walking out the prayer is equally dead. Oh, that's so good right now. You're quiet right now, but I'm preaching so good to you right now. Maybe you don't even know it. Prayer without walking out the prayer is equally dead. Jesus would say, and I quote, it is mindless repetition and babbling of words that don't mean anything. Prayer without walking out the prayer is a dead prayer. And there we are on the bleachers looking good. Oh God, fill my cup. And we wonder, <clears throat> why is God not filling my cup up? And God looks down at your cup. And God is like, but it's a Dixie cup you want me to fill. God is like, I don't fill Dixie cups up. I fill buckets up. You need to stretch yourself. Oh, I feel this too. And for some of you, you've achieved a certain level of blessing in your life and you've gotten to a certain place. And so maybe you've got a bucket, but all of a sudden you feel like your life has a cap on it and you don't know why. And you're on the bleachers and you're like, God, use me. God, bless me. And as to you, God is like, I don't fill buckets up. I fill dump trucks up. For you to get to the place where God can actually pour what God is trying to pour into your life, so that you can actually carry it, you're going to have to stretch yourself. And there, in my experience, is no better way to stretch yourself than to show a little faith. Like that great philosopher George Michael once said, <laughs> you got to have faith. Faith is like anybody under 30 doesn't get what I just said. Just ask your parents, they'll tell you, okay? Faith, you're so culturally deprived, you know? Faith, faith, faith is not about your comfort. Faith is about your obedience so that God can stretch you, so that God can bless you, so that you can be a more, a more formidable weapon in God's hand, so that God can use you more. You gotta show faith. So the first thing I wrote down when I wrote down all the obstacles they were facing, is that Mary is nine months pregnant. The second thing I wrote down was stranger hospitality. Mary and Joseph, over this 100 miles, would have to rely on stranger hospitality so that they would have a place to stay. It was the custom of their day that when they would take a big trip, there, there was no, like, Hotels.com. There was no Holiday Inn with a heated pool on the side of the road. There was none of that. There was you showing up at a complete stranger's house on their front door and being like, Hi! <laughs> Got a place for me? And that's how they would get around. And Mary and Joseph had to do this over 100 miles. Most scholars believe this trip took them 14 days. So around 14, and maybe they knew a few people along the way, but they didn't know 14 people over this stretch. Around 14 different times, Mary and Joseph showed up on somebody's front door. They were like, hi, can we stay here? And 14 different times, they had to have a conversation like this. Yes, she is as pregnant as she looks. I don't think she'll go into labor tonight, no. But if she does, you can cut the cord. And we'll maybe name the baby after you if you're, as long as your name is Jesus. You know? 14 different times they did not know where they were going to stay. You should write this down. Real faith often has this component 
of not knowing where X is going to come from. Real faith often has this component of not knowing where X is going to come from. Where is the house we're going to stay at going to come from, Joseph? Where are the people who are going to support my crazy idea going to come from? Where's the money going to come from? Let me stop and talk about money for a minute. I know everybody gets nervous when we talk about money in church. I used to, too. I did. I used to not like talking about money until I realized that the people who don't like talking about money in church are the people who are afraid of being blessed by God and they're afraid of being stretched. And so let's talk about money. If real faith often has this component of not knowing where X is going to come from, have you ever noticed how X often equals a dollar sign? Have you ever noticed how X often equals money? How am I going to pay for that, God? Right, it's not just me, right? You too? You get it. How am I going to pay for what you've laid on my heart? Let me give you something that will set you free. Watch this. God did not check the balance on your bank account before God decided to speak to you. God is not checking for the balance on your bank account. God is checking for your faith. God doesn't care about your bank balance so much as God cares about your obedience. God did not consult the zeros in your checking ledger before God told you to get up off the bleachers and be obedient. The balance on your bank account is the least thing on God's mind. He is the God who owns the cattle on a thousand hillsides. He is a God who flung the billion, billion stars in existence in this universe into existence. Do you think God cares about how many zeros you've got in your bank account? If God said it, God will always fund it every single time. You should be clapping right now because that's good stuff. God will always fund what he puts in your heart every time. Every time. It's like this. Here's a story. When we bought this building, we bought it out of foreclosure. So we got a really good deal on it. It's a 40,000 square foot building that we, we bought for $250,000. It's a God thing. Here's the problem. Uh, back then, we didn't have $250,000. We were an eight-year-old church back then. We're a 12-year-old church now. We didn't have $250,000. More than that, we knew that the phase one construction of this building, just phase one, to get in the building, would cost an additional $500,000. So we needed $750,000. Did I mention I had no idea where $750,000 was going to come from? Here is the thing. I knew we were supposed to have this building. I knew it because three weeks before I ever even laid eyes on it, I had a dream that I was walking through this exact building. I knew this was our building. Now listen, it didn't look as good as it does right now. In my dream, it was ugly. When I, walked, when I drove up to it the first time, it was even uglier in person, you know? But I knew this was our building. So I signed a $750,000 contract. Pastor Paula will tell you this is true. To bring $750,000 to show up and close with $750,000 in 30 days. Did I mention I had no clue where we were going to get the $750,000? Like no clue. Ten days later, I still got no clue where the $750,000 is going to come from. Twenty days later. I've still got no clue where the $750,000 is going to come from. Now, sometimes I get accused of preacher exaggeration. I'm not exaggerating one bit of this story, okay? This is how it actually went down. 20 days later, I got no clue. I'm starting to get scared. Like, like I'm afraid. I've risked it all. I put our name on the line. I put my name on the line. My ministry may be over if they, we don't figure this thing out. I am scared. Scared. Some people will tell you that real faith means you can't have any fear. For those people, I would just like to say, you have obviously never tried real faith. <laughs> you know? 
Some people say that faith is the absence of fear. That's all wrong. You should write this down. Faith is not the absence of fear. Faith is the presence of action in the middle of your fear. Faith is being willing to get up off the bleachers and follow Jesus when you don't have any idea where $750,000 is going to come from. This, to me, like the hilarity of this, I'm a lawyer, y'all, and I signed a contract. I got no clue. I'm like an OCD lawyer too, you know? And so God's just hilarious, real funny God, you know? Like sometimes, how's this going to happen? On day 25, I get a call from a bank. It's a Virginia bank. And they say, you know what? Maybe. And I'm like, so you're telling me there's a chance. <laughs> they, got, they, got, they got five days to come through. For the next four days, I call that bank two or three times a day. Because as any staff person here can tell you, when I want something to happen, I will bug the snot out of you to make it happen. I can probably get some amens from some staff people right now if I, if I ask for it, but they better not because they, they want their jobs. All right, so, 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 so I call them every day for the next four days. On day 29, everybody say day 29. My wife and I are on vacation in Bush Gardens in Williamsburg. We're closing the next day. On day 29, at 9.30 in the evening, the banker calls me up and he says, Pastor, we've got your $750,000. You can sign for your church tomorrow. It was a pretty cool story. You know, there, there is a saying that he's an on-time God. I'm here to tell you that he is a God who shows up at 9.30 in the evening uh, when you already brushed your teeth and put your retainer in and got your stretchy pajamas on. He is a God who is on time every time. I wish I had two or three people in the room who have seen an on-time God show up and bless them when they thought all hope was lost. He's a God who shows up on time. Real faith has this component of wondering where X is going to come from. Real faith will have you believing that the X you don't have in your pocket, God is just going to drop it in your hands. I said, the X you don't have in your pocket, God is just going to drop it in your hands. I feel this prophetically for somebody. The X you don't have in your pocket, God is just going to drop it in your hands. One more time. The X you don't have in your pocket, God is just going to drop it in your hands because you got up and showed faith. So I wrote that down. She's nine months pregnant, stranger hospitality, and then I wrote this down. As a man, I thought this was pretty important. Joseph has got to believe Mary's story. Men, you get this, right? Joseph and Mary went on the Maury Povich show, took the test, and uh, Joseph is not the father. You know? Joseph has a dream. And in the dream, God speaks to Joseph. I love how God speaks in dreams sometimes if we'll listen. God speaks to Joseph, and God tells Joseph, Joseph, Mary's a virgin. What is conceived of her is born of the Holy Spirit. You're the father, the earthly father of the Messiah. Joseph has got to believe this story. To me, Joseph's faith story is one of the most underrated faith stories and underreported faith stories in the entire Bible. Right? Joseph is taking a 100 miles long trip with a, with a nine months pregnant woman and they're not in an air conditioned Subaru and the baby in Mary's belly, Joseph is not even the baby daddy of. This is faith. You should write this down. Real faith 
will require you to believe a fantastical fact. Real faith will require you to believe a fantastical fact. This is crazy. Who's going to believe this? Right? Because faith is crazy. It's, it's crazy. I, I think every time you try real faith, it's crazy. People will look at you and be like, this is crazy. Where are you getting your facts from? This, this is crazy. Now, I know earlier we called faith fantastical, but fantastical is just a, it's just a, a fancy word for, for crazy. Faith is crazy. Every time you do it, it's crazy. You've got to be careful, though, because while faith is always crazy, just because it's crazy doesn't make it faith. Play a logic game with me. Every square is a rectangle, but not every rectangle is a square. Faith is always crazy, but just because it's crazy doesn't make it faith. I can't tell you the number of times I have watched other people, including myself, good people, struggling under the weight of crazy and calling crazy faith. But God never said it. God never said, go to Bethlehem. So we've got to learn as we work out our faith. That's what the Bible tells us to do, to work out our faith. We've got to learn to distinguish between our excitement and our emotion and God's direction. There's a difference between your emotion and God's direction. Let me, let me put it to you this way. Let me, let me talk plain to you. Just because it's sexy doesn't mean God said it. Girlfriend, I know that boy is fine. But just because it's, he's sexy doesn't mean God said give him your digits. You know, I know that job across the country is intriguing. But just because it pays more money does not believe God said pack your bags and go. We've got to learn to distinguish between our emotion and God's direction. They are two very different things. You've got to learn to distinguish between man's dream and God's dream. You want to know the difference? Your dream is unfertilized faith. See, what we do is we try, we pursue our dreams, and we try to give birth to a baby that God never fertilized. And we wonder why God isn't blessing it. And God's like, I'm not blessing it because I never said it. It wasn't me. But if God said it, then God fertilized it. If God spoke it, then there is nothing on this planet that will ever keep it from happening. If God spoke it into your life, it is, it is destined to occur. The only thing that can keep it from not occurring is you in your life choosing to stay on the bleachers. So why, why do Mary and Joseph take this trip and we call it faith? I mean, it's crazy. We call it faith because God said it. Let me show you. In Micah chapter 5, hundreds of years earlier, the Old Testament prophet says, But you, O Bethlehem, are only a small village among all the people of Judah, yet a ruler of Israel, whose origins are in the distant past, will come from you on my behalf. There is this Old Testament prophecy that the Messiah would come out of Bethlehem. Mary and Joseph, being devout Jews, had to know this prophecy. They had to know. And, and, and so Bethlehem called out to them. And I wonder, what is your Bethlehem? What is calling out to you? What is it? Did you know a lot of scholars think Mary didn't even have to make this trip based on the, the customs of the day uh, and, and the patriarchal society that they lived in? Most scholars think that Joseph could have gone as the man and been like, here, here for Mary too. She didn't even have to go on this trip. But Mary refused to sit in the bleachers. This is why we call this faith, that a nine-month pregnant woman got herself to Bethlehem because Bethlehem called out to her. What is calling out to you? 
What is it? Hey, I want you to stand. And we're going to finish this time together. And I need you to stand because God told me to ask you a question. And I need you ready to receive the question that's about to be asked. I think this is a heaven question over your life. We've talked about having the faith to get to Bethlehem. But this is the question for you from heaven. What do you do when God asks you to leave Bethlehem? Oh. See, this is what I know about us. This is what I know about us. Most of us think we're already in Bethlehem. Most of us think, this message isn't for me. I've already arrived. Mary and Joseph spend two years in Bethlehem. And I understand why they did. It's a hundred miles trip to get there. They fought for Bethlehem. They pushed for Bethlehem. They get to Bethlehem and they give birth to a miracle. Bethlehem is the place of their miracle. They've got an amazing story to tell. At the end of their two years, wise men show up with gifts of gold, myrrh, and frankincense. With tens of thousands of dollars, they show up in real money. And so Bethlehem is not just the place of their miracle. Bethlehem is also the place of their paycheck. I understand why they stay. I'm talking to people right now who got comfortable in Bethlehem. You know, as I've gotten older, I have found that the first trip to Bethlehem is easier than the second. You know, like for me, faith was easier when I was younger. I'm not saying faith was easy when I was young. That waiting on that $750,000, that was one of the great, great trials of my life. But after you settle down in Bethlehem, it's not just you and Mary anymore. You got kids, mortgage, maybe you've got employees, people you're responsible to, ministries you've started. first trip to Bethlehem is usually easier but what do you do when God says leave the place of your miracle and you've got all this stuff now what do you do then Joseph and Mary are in Bethlehem for two years at the end of the two years a madman king named Herod finds out that the Messiah has been born and Herod orders that all children in the vicinity of Bethlehem under the age of two be slaughtered in a Holocaust level event that we call the slaughtering of the innocents. Babies are being exterminated. God speaks to Joseph. Joseph dreams again. Hey, will you dare to dream again in the middle of your Bethlehem? Joseph dreams again and God says, leave Bethlehem and go to Egypt. Will you dare to dream again? Will you dare to leave Bethlehem? I'll leave you with this. Today's Bethlehem will become tomorrow's Nazareth. Today's there. I've got to get there. I've got to get there. Today's there will become tomorrow's here. And a new there will call out to you. Are you willing to leave Bethlehem? So we're going to sing this song. And you can reflect on this in your chairs. But I think that there are probably a few of you in the room that God is calling to get up off the bleachers. And if that is you, I want to ask you to make a step forward. And, and it's a symbolic thing. And come stand on one of these distance stickers out here and we'll pray with you. If, you, if God is really calling you, I need to leave my Bethlehem, then come on up here. The rest of us, let's just worship. But come on and we'll pray with you. Let's sing this. My hands purify my heart. I want to burn for you. The Lord calls you. 
determination in your life I pray for your ears that you can hear exactly what God is saying I pray for supernatural strategies over your life that that when you step this way or that people will be like how did you know to do that I pray for your faith to rise I pray for you to have the courage to burn bridges where you need to burn bridges for you to build new bridges where they need to be constructed. I pray for you to be, for you to have the determination to turn your ears to the cause of you're so crazy and to turn your ears to heaven in the name of Jesus. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I ask this question every Sunday. Are you where you are supposed to be with God? I mean, are you saved? Are you right with God? Maybe you've never been saved. Maybe you were at one point, but, but you've sort of strayed and your commitment is not where it's supposed to be. Maybe you grew up in church and, and you've just fallen away. And your relationship with God is not where it needs to be. You feel this distance. If that's you, the Bible says that in one moment of faith, you can begin to set your journey right. It's as easy as ABC. You admit you've not lived the way you're supposed to and you ask God to forgive you. You believe that Jesus is the Son of God alive today and you confess that from this moment forward, He's in your heart. I'm just going to real quickly, when I count to three, ask you to raise your hand. And in raising your hand, you're saying, I want to be right with God. I'm tired of the distance. And raise it high. Who cares if people see you? This is bigger than somebody's arbitrary opinion of you anyway. So on the count of three, I want you to raise your hand and leave it up in the air. One, I want to be saved. Is there anybody? Two, three, raise your hands. There's one. Is there another? Is there another? My brother, you just raised your hand. I want somebody to walk you up here, and I'm going to pray with you. Can we applaud this, this young man who just made this decision? Come on up here. I want to pray with you. Bring him up here. Come on up with me. I want to pray this with you. You can pray this in your own words, or you can just say mine. But pray something like this. God, I admit I've done wrong things. I've sinned and I'm sorry. I believe that your son Jesus died for me. But three days later, he was resurrected so that I can have this moment. And I confess from this day forward you're the Lord of my life you're my God you're my best friend you're my everything in the name of Jesus amen and amen hey I want you to 
go with Dennis. Can we give this young man a hand and walk with him? Welcome to the family. Hey, family, I want you to confess these things through faith with me. Say this with me. Say it with me. I believe God's word about what I have, all that I can do, and who I can be. Therefore, I am physically fit, 